Good afternoon, Asia Pacific, and good morning, Sweden. Welcome to the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. My name is Lisa Ferter. I'm the general manager of Swedjam in Singapore. Today, we have with us member companies from 11 different Swedjams in the APEC region. Um, you know, the pandemic has brought a lot of bad. Nobody can deny that. But here is one thing positive. Uh, the collaboration between the different sweat chants in our huge region has transformed during the past two years. Uh, one could ask oneself why we needed a pandemic to discover this, but uh, here we are. Our apex stage is a big one, and through the digital communication that we are now so used to, we can use it to drive our mission to promote the interests and the value propositions of Swedish businesses in the region. And today we are launching our new APAC CEO series, where we will invite group CEOs from our diverse fleet of flagship Swedish companies to give their perspectives on where they are heading within the, their specific uh, industry or market. As this is the first launch, we will send out a one minute survey afterwards to see if, uh, you know, if you're happy with the session and to get your feedback. So we are honored today to have with us um, Mr. Jonas Samuelsson, President and CEO of Electrolux. Electrolux turned 100 years in 2019 and uh, has during this time been at the forefront of many uh, well-known products and making both inventing and making many well-known products available and affordable to consumers. We also have with us today Martin von Aronet uh, from Stockholm as well, Senior Vice President of Communications uh, at Electrolux. During this past decade, uh, this, the industry, the appliance industry has been transformed. Uh, consumers today expect brands to offer a cus customer experience that is innov as, as innovative as their products. Digitalization of lifestyles has disrupted traditional distribution channels and even more so during the pandemic, of course. Uh, and the market for smart home appliances is growing rapidly, not the least in APAC. And then obviously the big one, sustainability and how to create a roadmap to climate neutrality within the appliance industry. In order to expand and deepen the conversation that we will have here today, we have also invited Rima Bhattacharya to the table. Uh, Rima is leading the ESG unit at the specialist risk consultancy, Control Risks. She's a spokesperson for the company in Asia Pacific and a frequent contributor in the media on ESG business topics, as well as broader political and economic trends in APAC. So we are hoping uh, to have a relaxed yet interesting conversation here today, both between Jonas and Rima, but also with the audience. So uh, please forward your questions and comments via the chat, and we will do our very best to bring them up during the last 30 minutes of our hour here together. Um, so now I have the great pleasure to give the floor to Yuna Samuelsson. Uh, we know that you have a strong vision and a passion for how you would like to lead Electrolux into a net zero future. And this is important, but not to forget as well, you have just also led over 50,000 employees through a pandemic. And we are just about seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully after this massive crisis. And we obviously hope to hear your perspectives on this as well. What are the lessons learned and what new trends have Electrolux managed to capitalize on during these past two years, which will, uh, we, will now set you up for the coming decade. So welcome, Jonas, over to you. Thank you so much, and, uh, and it's really a great pleasure to be with you and an honor to uh, introduce this new series. And uh, yeah, as you said, it's been uh, it's been a, a couple of, of years of pandemic here, and I know there's a number of uh, Electrox uh, team members on this call as well, and they recognize this background. Uh, me uh, participating on video from from my home office here, and um, and um, hopefully this will be a, a lot more a rare occasion going forward. I'm actually uh, traveling to the beautiful city of Singapore uh, this afternoon for the first time in a in a very long time so so really looking forward to that and getting back into into a more normal life as i'm sure all of you uh, all of you are um so so really happy to share a few thoughts about uh, about electrolux i'll see if i can do that here share my screen and <clears throat> and you know as uh, i said we we're a we're a global company we're a soon 102 years 103 years old um uh, selling approximately 60 million products a year 
you know, with a turnover of last year, 125 million, uh, a billion Swedish kroner, 52,000 employees. And, and, but I think the most important number here that I just mentioned is that the 60 million products uh, sold per year, uh, because our products, they last for a decade or, or more, which means that we're, we have about 600 million products out there in operation on an, on an ongoing basis, continuously impacting people's daily lives in an important way. And, and in ways that have gotten even more important now during the pandemic as people have spent much more time at home. So the importance of the, the quality of the products that we produce, the innovation that we provide has only increased during uh, this turbulent period. And if you think about our, our strategy, we're founding it based on five key global long-term trends really impacting our industry and, and many, many other uh, industries. The last five, six years, we really structured our, our strategy um, taking a, a stance of, off of these five uh, key trends. So the first one, and, and actually by far the most important one, is the dramatic increase in consumer power enabled by digitalization. So the first two here really go together, consumer power and digitalization, because we know that consumers have much more ability and use much more of their time to do research about our products. We know that over 90% uh, of consumers look at other people's reviews, star ratings. Uh, we know that they spend more time shopping around and they have a clearer perspective of what they want from their products. And through uh, other experiences, through digitalization, they also have much higher demands on their products providing uh, for their individual needs. And that's also where digitalization, smart home, smart products come in and, and enabling us to provide better solutions for, for consumers' needs, regardless of where they are around the world. And very importantly, we know that consumers pay more and more attention to uh, their supplier's sustainability uh, record. We know that 90% of consumers are willing to pay more uh, for brands to give back to society. We know that two thirds of consumers around the world are willing to pay up to 15% 15, uh, 15 more for uh, sustainable goods and, and, and goods that provide a better experience for them at the same time. And we know that a, a significant majority of consumers around the world, really wh wherever you go, think that sustainability is a crucially important uh, issue that is getting more important. Uh, you know, uh, they, they realized during the pandemic how important it is. And at the same time, we know that half of consumers around the world don't really know how to change their behaviors to, uh, to live more sustainably. And this is an opportunity that we have to support them. The fourth trend that we're, we're seeing and have experienced for a long time, and we've been a, an active participant in that, is consolidation and global scale, right? To be able to, to provide these highly uh, advanced, uh, digitalized, uh, smart solutions, we need scale, we need global scale. So this industry is consolidating down to a you know, handful of global, uh, gl global companies and innovators and, and Electrox is fortunate to be one of those. And, and we wanna continue to drive that global, uh, the benefits of global scale. And fifth, and, and, and also extremely importantly, and I think very relevant as we're talking here today, the global middle class is growing rapidly. We have more than 6 billion consumers that are either in or entering uh, the global middle class. And of course, most importantly in APAC in Middle East Africa. <clears throat> and, and what's important for us there is that a lot of these consumers are moving from their first appliance, maybe a simple cooker or a simple fridge to something more, uh, let's say innovative, something that meets their needs in a, in a more tailored way. And that's where our innovation power comes in and provides more opportunities for consumers. So th these are the key trends that really drive our strategy. <clears throat> and a lot of those trends have really been accelerated during the pandemic. Again, people have spent more time at home. They're asking for more performance out of their products. We're shopping online. All of us are shopping more online. Uh, we've seen massive increases also in our category, which is a little bit more complicated to shop online because we need uh, deliver an installation of a bulky product. But also for us, it's increased, increased massively. We see the consumers are spending more on their homes. Uh, as they've traveled less, if they spend more time at home, they, need, they, they spend their hard earned money more on improving their homes. And we're of course taking advantage of that. Again, as mentioned, 
sustainability is becoming something that has taken a higher uh, importance during the pandemic. You know, of course, including uh, sanitization, clean, uh, uh, you know, homes and so on, which we play a part of, but also, of course, a higher sense of, of uh, awareness around the challenges that the planet is facing has been highlighted by, by the pandemic. And in this uncertainty, <clears throat> people are looking for trusted um, partners, trusted brands, uh, high quality products, which of course also is a, is a strength for us. So while the pandemic has been a, a huge challenge for all of us and, and for people around the world, it has uh, given us some opportunities to accelerate the strategy and the development that we've already um, been on. <clears throat> if we then take a quick look at our global presence, you can see that we're still quite heavily focused on, on Europe and, and North America, which is our historical baseland, if you will. We're also quite strong in Latin America, but we have a, a great opportunity to grow in APAC and, and EMEA, as you can see. And this is something that we're focusing very, very strongly on, uh, in our, uh, you know, driven by our APAC MEA uh, organization based in, in Singapore, but present all over the APAC MEA region. And we'll talk a little bit more about how, how we're driving that going forward. We, we split our offering in, in three main areas of, of consumer benefits. So we talk about great tasting food, all the products in the kitchen from cookers and, and, and oven hoods, uh, fridges, freezers, ovens, and so on. That's uh, about 62% of our, our sales. Care is uh, caring for our, our clothes, washing machines and dryers and the like. And then well-being is about uh, keeping your home clean and your air clean and your water clean. So all kinds of home, uh, um, home environment improvement products, let's say. So that's a little bit of, of, of kind of who we are and where we are. But then of course, uh, this underrepresentation that we have in the large emerging markets is, 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 a, is a challenge and an opportunity for us that we really want to want to take advantage of. And if you look at here, these are all the, the uh, emerging markets as, as we define them, and their market size in billions of, of US dollars. So you can see that we have really, really huge markets also for, for our goods, uh, which, which provides us very significant growth opportunities going forward. Um, so the, the three innovation areas that I that I uh, talked about, and I think what's what's um, let's say new and different to some extent about our um, our approach to innovation, our strategy is that we we try to think a little bit less product centric and think much more user centric. What is the situation that our users are are facing on a daily basis, and how can we make those more, enjoy, more enjoyable and more sustainable for our consumers. So we talk about uh, leveraging digital uh, technology and, and focused innovation to provide more responsive and more sustainable kitchen systems. So we'll talk a little bit more about specifically what that means in, in, in for example, in, in Asia in a, in a short while. When it comes to care, we know that people don't really uh, to think much about their washing machines, frankly. We don't think that they, they don't like doing uh, laundry very much, frankly, but they love their clothes. And they think a lot about how can, uh, how can they avoid deteriorating their clothes. So this is a huge, huge area of innovation for us, really providing smart solutions that provide perfect care, tailored care for individual garments every time. Uh, and, and this is something that consumers are really willing to pay for. And then similarly, maybe uh, uh, vacuum cleaning isn't your, your favorite chore, but what you do is you love coming home to a clean home where the uh, surfaces and the air feels fresh and, and refreshed. And if we can provide a responsive ecosystem of products, some of them autonomous, some of them uh, like the product on, on the screen here that's immediately available, beautifully designed. So you, you're happy to keep your uh, your vacuum cleaner out in your in your room on an ongoing basis, so you can just grab it and and clean that spot that needs to be be, be cleaned. All these areas of consumer experiences provides us a, a new um, a, let's say space for for innovation that we're really driving hard. And of course, then we we translate that into our main brands uh, brand language, and and our main brand being Electrolux. Uh, we have this uh, strong core of being from Sweden, designed in Sweden, and which gives us credibility when we talk about 
leadership in sustainable solutions because consumers around the world associate Sweden, of course, with sustainable living and with human-centric innovation. And these are all uh, global trends that are extremely well suited for, for acceleration through the, uh, through the Electrix brand. Uh, we have really three main brands, Electrix AEG and Frigidaire. And, uh, and then we have a number of supporting brands, local brands around the world. We've, we've listed a, a couple of them here that are relevant in the APEC and, and, and MIA region. But I think very importantly, what we're doing now is, or have been doing for, for a number of years, is we're using that brand portfolio to really target specific consumer uh, audiences. So the electrics uh, consumer is somebody that is more on the premium side, but with progressive values, uh, really caring about sustainability, caring about making a difference, caring about the open and, 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 and progressive um, uh, sort of lifestyle that's embodied by, by Sweden. Yeah, when it comes to AEG, the, uh, the AEG range of products is more and the brand is more targeted towards premium consumers that focus on innovation, quality, let's say German values, Germanic values, historically, if you will, and AEG being a German brand fits extremely well with that type of premium consumer. And then Frigidaire, which is the 30% of sales here, and then the other uh, local brands that we have, is more about more traditional, a little bit more mass, but people that really care about their family, their local community, want to provide uh, a healthy and sustainable meal for, for, for their family. So quite, quite different uh, consumer demographics, and then our different brands uh, really being targeted to, uh, to those. And that gives us strength, that gives us credibility, that gives us breakthrough uh, in, in communicating with consumers. Again, leveraging the innovation um, uh, areas that, that I just talked about, but in a slightly different way for the different target audiences. So then what does that mean for, for our local consumers in, in APAC and MIA? Leveraging the general insights and the specific consumer behaviors that we have observed in, uh, in Asia Pacific and the specific needs that they have. So, so the first example there is our Ultra Echo washer, which we sell in, mainly in, in Indonesia. Indonesia is a country, many of you know, with a fairly low uh, electric power supply. And so we've developed a, uh, a washer that can, can wash perfectly with ambient temperature water. You don't need to heat the water at all uh, and still get great uh, uh, washing results. We're also adding vapor refresh, which uses 97% uh, less, uh, less water. And now we're also introducing a, a microplastics filter uh, for those that, that, that really want to avoid emitting microplastics into the wastewater. Uh, another innovation, of course, in, in uh, APAC, um, a lot of consumers use uh, heavy oil in their in, and high temperatures in their, in their cleaning. They, they're discovering that washing machines, uh, dishwashers don't really remove uh, those heavy oils as well as they should. So we've provided for a heavy oil program with more, uh, more deep cleaning of, and, and removing oil residues for, for our, our consumers that use that a lot. Um, Another, let's say, tailored uh, innovation example is this uh, gas hob that has three burners, one for a wok, one for uh, boiling soup or something like that, and one for a built-in steaming uh, accessory for steaming fish and, 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 uh, and vegetables, for example, which really provides for a full meal, a typical Asian uh, cooking style meal um, in, in a very targeted way. And then finally on, on refrigeration, uh, we've introduced a taste lock auto, which uh, keeps fruit and vegetable at the perfect both temperature and humidity for a full week in meat, which means that they're, they stay fresh for uh, a longer time. And, and we all know that uh, Asian consumers really pay a lot of attention to their, their fruits and vegetables. So if we can provide for a better environment and keeping them fresh for longer, that's of course a fantastic selling proposition. So you can see we're really targeting uh, the, the sort of the same innovation areas, but targeting in uh, them at, at local consumer tastes and needs. Another example is that we're, <clears throat> we're, we're um, going after specific um, consumer value propositions through different business models as well uh, in Asia. And here's a couple of examples where, for example, in, in Vietnam, in our direct-to-consumer channel, we're providing for a full um, uh, life cycle of our products, the, the, the sale, in, uh, the installation and the remover, removal and recycling of uh, the old product. 
which of course is a much more sustainable way of, of, of replacing your products and, and easier and, and uh, less inconvenient for consumers as well. Also, for example, in Singapore, we're uh, piloting leasing air purifiers for consumers that don't want to maybe invest in a, in a product or don't know if they really need it long term, but are concerned about uh, air pollution, indoor air pollution, this is a great way to, to try out if this is the right product for them and, uh, and really uh, it provides a, a, a new channel, new sales opportunity for us. So those are just a few examples of, of what we're doing specifically for, for consumers in, in, um, in APAC and MIA. And then finally, I wanted to switch to, uh, to sustainability. As, as, as was said, it's really a core uh, requirement going forward. And I won't talk too much about uh, all of our accolades. I, I think we've been a, a company that's been in the forefront of, of sustainable thinking really since the 1990s and gives us kind of a, a, a an core, an integrated way of thinking about uh, about sustainability. That's not so much about uh, what accolades we can get from, from external asso associations. It's more about how can we provide uh, better solutions for, for, for our consumers in a more sustainable way. So, so this is kind of the framework um, that we've talked about. And, and we talk a lot about uh, the fact that we don't have a sustainability strategy. We have a sustainable strategy. It starts, of course, with, with being a better company, uh, being climate neutral in our operations um, with clean and resource efficient operations, acting ethically, uh, leading in diversity, respecting human rights, and of course, taking responsibility also for our, our full supply chain. So that's, that's the core, that's what we have to do first. We'll come back to more about that in, in, in a moment. But then of course, and, and we know that, that, that the, the climate impact of our products are mainly in the use space. 85% um, of, of the, the CO2 footprint is in, in the use, use space. So we know we need to lead in energy and resource efficient solutions and also offer circular solutions and business models like, like the ones I just, uh, just talked about a, a moment ago. And of course, we have to ensure that we don't have harmful materials in our products for many reasons, but not least because we want to make them uh, recyclable. And then the third leg of our, our sustainable strategy, and I think this is really the most important one, is enabling consumers to live more sustainably by making it easier for consumers to make sustainable eating uh, their choice. Healthy, sustainable eating is uh, something that, that a lot of consumers think a lot about, but they don't do it because they, they find barriers to uh, making sustainable choices um, in terms of what uh, ingredients they buy and store and how they cook them. And, and that, this is an, an innovation area for us that, that's really, really fertile. Again, talked about clothing. Clothing, the, the clothing industry is one of the most polluting in the world. We know that. You know, can we innovate to make clothes last twice as long without the environmental impact? through better care solutions? Yeah, the answer is yes, and we are doing that. And then finally, making homes healthier and more sustainable through smart solutions for all, all air, water, and, and floors. And we know that consumers around the world are super concerned about uh, uh, the in indoor air pollution, water pollution, and so on, uh, that they're exposed to, and, and we can provide innovations to enable better living, uh, in, despite, uh, especially in large cities that, um, um, the, the, the constraints that uh, consumers are living under. So, <clears throat> so of course, this is this is a, all nice talk. Uh, the the, re, the real question is about what we're doing. Um, so we have uh, adopted back in 2017 uh, science-based targets. We we're one of the first uh, large companies to do that. <clears throat> and the targets that we set was to to reduce our carbon emissions by 80 percent uh, in in operations. And I, I can. If, you know, report that we're very close to reaching that 80 percent already in 2021. I think we're at 78, 79 percent, something like that. So we will get that 80 percent. Again, that's the key first step, cleaning in front of our own uh, doorsteps and making sure that our operations are sustainable. And then most importantly, and as I mentioned that 85 percent of our carbon footprint comes from the use of our products. So we set the target of uh, reducing carbon emissions by, uh, from, from the use of our products by 25%. Of course, we don't have the problem of converting from, from fossil fuel to, to electricity. All, all, most of our products are already um, run by electricity, but, but the electricity is produced to a large extent using uh, uh, fossil fuels. 
So of course, energy efficiency improvements are, are extremely important here. Then we've set uh, a target to be fully cl climate neutral in operations by, by 2030. You know, the first 80% are, are kind of the first 80, 85% are the easy ones. The last 15 are, are extremely difficult to abate, but we are, and, and we have planned uh, that we'll achieve climate neutrality in operations by 2030. A very, very significant effort underlying that. And then we have the longer term target of being climate neutral across the value chain. And, and of course you can say 2050, that's a, that's a long period. But the, the, the concern of course, is that to get there, we need um, all of our consumers' electricity to be produced uh, using sustainable um, uh, renewable energy. And that, that's gonna take a while, but for sure, everything that we can influence, including uh, sourcing green steel, uh, recycled and, and, and carbon neutral plastics and so on, we will, we will get to those points uh, much earlier. So, uh, you know, net zero is, is a very, very uh, real target for us. And, and, and we're taking um, very aggressive and, and I would say short term, fairly costly actions to get there. But we have a firm belief that this is a, um, a competitive advantage for us. This is something that's going to continue to place us uh, top of mind among consumers around the world. Um, and, um, uh, you know, being a, a, a sustainability leader, company that has sustainability at the core of its strategy is going to be, uh, a, a, a continue to be a huge competitive advantage for us going forward. And, and I finished by, uh, maybe some of you knew, know, we just recently had some uh, fantastic Nordic lights here in Stockholm. So I, I leave you with this, uh, this beautiful picture of, of uh, downtown Stockholm. And uh, with that, I leave, I leave it open for questions. Thank you very much, Jonas, for this overview and for setting the scene here. Um, we have uh, already got some feedback from the audience, uh, but we will hold on to that a bit and give the word to Rima first. Um, as a risk analyst, what is the first question or reflection that comes to mind as you've listened to Jonas now? Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be speaking to all of you today. Um, and thank you, Jonas, for that fantastic presentation. It was quite interesting to hear you talk about Electrolux's vision and its priorities for the future. And I'm, I'm quite excited to have you on the hot seat for the next half an hour to have a deeper discussion on sustainability. I think uh, you did speak to us about um, Electrolux's net zero strategy. Uh, we, but, but from, an, an, from an analyst point of view, from a risk analyst point of view, I do see 2021 has already kick-started a decade where a lot of companies are coming out in the fore and obviously claiming that they're very uh, close to net zero transition. They have robust plans in, the plane, in, in place. But transition dynamics, climate risk, climate action, all of these issues are becoming a major implement implementation question for most companies. I think my question to you is, I mean, being a global appliances leader in this, in this sort of environment, how do you sort of develop a, 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 you know, a, a, a holistic sustainability agenda for a world that is decarbonizing and also recovering from the pandemic in an unequal pace? Yeah. No, I, I think this is an extremely relevant um, question, and, and, and specifically, of course, affordability of sustainable solutions becomes uh, a, a major issue. Look, I, I think the, um, uh, the, the first part of, 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 of my answer is, relates to the, the core of, of who we are, right? We didn't start thinking about sustainable solutions uh, last year or, or two years ago. Uh, this actually started um, in, in earnest back in the 90s. And, and we were uh, fortunate and unfortunate to be exposed to the, the Freon uh, issue at the time that, you know, ate into the uh, ozone layer, the, the refrigerant in, in, in fridges and freezers. And so we were exposed in a, in a very unpleasant way to the need for sustainable solutions very, very early on. And, and management at the time decided, look, we can fight it or we can join it. And, and they decided to join it and said, okay, we're just going to be sustainability leaders. And, and incredible foresight at the time. But that means that we have you know, core processes embedded in, in, in our company that is um, targeted towards always finding the more sustainable solution to any type of problem that we're, um, that we're facing. 
and really worrying about and caring about what are the second and third sort of step impact of, mm -hmm. of what we're, we're, we're providing. And that's why, let's say, we're also thinking, you know, more, we're really kind of impact focused and saying, all right, we have to clean our own, you know, in front, front of our own front gate first, because otherwise we're not, not credible. And we've made, you know, enormous progress in that. And pretty much, I would say for, for practical purposes, we're almost done uh, with that. So now it's more about how can we impact consumers' lives around the world? And so, so what we're doing now increasingly is um, uh, life cycle analysis, basically saying, mm -hmm. you know, the typical life cycle of a product, what are all the different things, all the way from the mine to the, to the waste dump, if you will, what are all the things that impact um, uh, the climate? And, and not just, you know, climate change, water use, uh, wastewater, uh, and, 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 and all those things. And, and I think this gives us the opportunity then to tailor solutions for uh, local situations um, around the world. Understanding affordability um, and I say, okay, what are the most sustainable uh, solutions we can provide within a specific you know, price cost band, let's say, of, of, of a product. And, uh, and again, our, our, our long history in thinking about that means that we can just push on. on forward. Right, but when you think about uh, emerging markets, and, and of mm. course, a big part of your strategy is to expand in emerging markets. Yeah. Life cycle analysis, getting that information on the ground, uh, and also supply chains for that matter are extremely fragmented. You know, yeah. there are different political agendas, regulations are, are polarizing. So, I mean, what about that? I mean, how do you plan to cope with that kind of, you know, those kind of Im immense challenges with? And radical shift in, in supply chains um, mm -hmm. in, in markets like Asia, for example. Yeah, no, uh, there, there's no doubt that it, that the, the variability is a challenge, and 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 we've actually um, um, worked through both through industry associations and and United uh, Nations to to try and harmonize regula the regulatory frameworks for, mm. um, uh, for example, re refrigerants, right? So we we joined something that's called the the Cool Coalition, very nerdy name uh, for refrigerant uh, um, uh, um, abatement of, of, of uh, very sort of high carbon uh, footprint equivalent refrigerants uh, around the world. So, because again, to your point, if the regulatory framework is, isn't there, we can mm. do whatever we want, but, but it will never have an, have an impact. So you have to work on, 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 on really on, on all fronts there. Another example, for example, is uh, energy efficiency. You know, these, the ABC class uh, uh, ratings that, that many countries have, have adopted. That was, that was initially um, put in place in, in, in Europe. And, and we're, of course, a, a strong proponent of, of introducing those clear sort of energy class frameworks, because then we can, we can explain mm. to consumers that, well, maybe it costs 50 euros more, but you save this much energy and this, you know, reduces your your energy bill, but it's only if that can be regulated and yeah. and policed, if you will, that we can build the trust among consumers that is actually what it, you know, what, what we state, right? So so we're we're for sure we're very clear that we're not acting alone in this yeah. environment. We have to act through a regulatory framework and we're uh, very actively pursuing that. Right. Uh, taking a step back a little bit, um, I think as an Asia analyst, there is there is a big debate on you know what is a, you know at a corporate level what is a good you know sustainability strategy do you divest out of uh, you know sectors which are fossil fuel dependent uh, dependent or is engagement the right strategy mm -hmm. of course in Asia and again being in a carbon intensive business it has its it has its own unique challenges what what is your point of view on that because this is another it's a big debate and a big issue for for mm -hmm. businesses in Asia I think generally yeah. Yeah, I, I think, frankly, I, I, I don't really see that as the, the, the main issue for, for us, right? Because mm. at the end of the day, we are providing products that are a core part of, of people's daily lives. You know, they're, they're, you know, you can't really say, you know, keep your fresh uh, uh, milk, uh, you know, in, in room temperature. I mean, that's not a good sustainable solution. You need a fridge and, mm. and, and, and so on. So, so, so for us, it's more around, you know, it's not about divesting from its own, it's providing, it's, it's developing more efficient solutions. Just right. constantly, relentlessly working on, on energy efficiency and, and making it clear, and that's the key point, making it more uh, transparent and clear to consumers 
what choices they can make to live more sustainably, as I, uh, as I talked about. Washing clothes at lower temperatures, but with equally good um, you know, cleaning results and, and better care results. Your, your clothes last longer, right? Mm. All those choices. So, so we look at it more from that perspective. We look at it from consumers' daily lives. How can we help them live more sustainably? Right. Um, and also, I think I want to uh, come back to the idea of, you know, again, the, the corporate responsibility. We see globally, you know, companies coming under intense pressure to prove that they're doing their fair share. And, uh, and again, this proof point, I mean, proving that point is a difficult one because on one hand, there is a proliferation of regulations and standards globally. And, and of course, companies are facing growing risks, le legal risks, and, and also, you know, greenwashing allegations for cherry picking sustainable financial in a, in a sort of information. But, but I do see that, you know, there's a global governance vac vacuum and regulatory vacuum. For, from, from your point of view, you do stress a lot on innovation. But do you, do you also think it's a problem of measurement and, and communication uh, also? Yeah, there, there's no doubt that, 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 um, there's, a, that you know, there's a need of, of a stronger framework. And that's being developed, unfortunately, by many different uh, bodies, right? So it, it doesn't exactly. become really one framework. It becomes more than one. But, but what, we've, um, um, uh, what we've really kind of um, uh, embraced is the... CDP, the, the, um, uh, the um, Carbon Disclo Disclosure Project Program, um, mm -hmm. which uh, is the is the created the science-based targets, and 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 really it, it takes um, a starting point in um, really the full sort of uh, carbon uh, footprint impact of, of all your activities, and it's an auditable uh, uh, auditable framework and. And in the absence of something that's more sort of hard code uh, regulated at this point, we've, we've chosen to adopt that, that CDP, Carbon Disclosure um, uh, Program Framework. And, and this has been extremely useful for us. And I, I forgot to mention actually that, that we have part of our long-term uh, incentive program for senior leaders. 20% of that is actually based on uh, achieving the targets we've set, uh, science-based targets that we've set of 80% uh, uh, reduction of, of emissions from operations and 25% and from product use. And, and, and again, this is audited by, by our auditors. So yes, the, the, it would be great if there was a, a uh, one global uh, disclosure framework, mm -hmm. but uh, we think CDP provides a good one in the absence of that. Great. Uh, again, a related question. So. Um, you know, unlike traditional financial information, I think one of the key challenges to communicate your sustainability strategy or performance is the fact that you have a diverse array of stakeholders you're speaking to. So you have activist investors who want to see, you know, what are the, what is the financial material impact? Your customers who have different expectations from your sustainability story that they, you know, what is the impact on society? Regulators want some other kind of information. So yeah. it's this idea of, you know, having one piece of communication that targets all of them and speaks meaningfully to everybody. Do you think, is, do you find that challenging? Because pl plenty of my clients, I think that's the idea, you know, where do you prioritize? Again, mm -hmm. it depends on the markets and the issues in, in those markets. Right. So an Asia will be different from in Europe. So what are your broad views on that? Is that is that a challenge? Is that something that you're you've been able to? I mean, at Electrolux, uh, been able to mitigate? Yeah, it, it it is a challenge, and and I think there's also the, the one challenge is that there are multiple different perspectives that are legitimate yes. to this, and then there is also multiple perspectives that are maybe legitimate but not so uh, important, frankly. <laughs> you know, um, right. And so so the challenge for us as a company is to to really identify. Well, for us, for Electrolux, our impact on the planet and our impact on people's lives, what really matters? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's why we created this for the vector framework that I, that I went through of saying, okay, we want to look at this from all the relevant uh, uh, viewpoints that, that, you know, in our best estimate, of course, there may be things that we're missing and new things coming up, but mm -hmm. based on what we know, here are the nine areas, you know, three main areas and nine uh, sub uh, buckets that really matter, you know, mm. from a carbon footprint perspective, but also from uh, an ethical perspective, mm. diversity and, and inclusion perspective, and, and, and so on. And, and we've set very specific, clear targets uh, in all those nine, uh, nine areas. And that was now 
uh, I guess, you know, those nine areas have been with us, Martin, I guess, for nine, ten years now. So, mm -hmm. so it's, not, it's not new. Uh, it's something that we've been, been focused on. For, so we have a, you know, we're, we're, we have a, a, a reasonable degree of, of confidence when it comes to saying, all right, this is really what matters for us. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that gives us also, uh, uh, you know, a, a little bit more of a steady compass needle when it come, when all these, uh, you know, sort of media topics of the day uh, mm -hmm. come over us, we can say, all right, well, here's how we're dealing with that. Because that's not that's part of our framework. And have those targets evolved with the market realities and you know socioeconomic realities? Like you said, there's yeah. an expanding middle class. The socioeconomic for fabric, I think, globally is is kind of going through a massive transition. So yeah. I'm sure achieving those targets will be difficult or easy compared to the markets you operate in. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, there's a geographic perspective to it, and there's also this sort of consumer. I should say consumer awareness um, aspect of it uh, that that's really evolving of saying you know uh, maybe uh, and, and I guess especially in emerging markets that you know there, there is this needs hierarchy right where you say well my, my, my most important priority is putting food on the table and then yeah. well you know it's only when you fully achieve that and you feel confident that you can take the next step of saying I, I care about how right right and and uh, and, and I think the good news is that more and more people around the world are at that stage now that they're they care about how uh, they, they care about the you know the healthfulness of, of the food uh, the sustainability uh, of, of their lifestyles mm -hmm. and this is something that frankly is a huge market a business opportunity for us uh, because you know we we, we only sell yeah. products when consumers like what they're seeing right and and um uh, and this is really, this really is core uh, so, to us. So, so we've expanded really our, both our, our uh, viewpoint on sustainability and our communication on sustainability much mm. more towards sustainable living as opposed mm. to sustainable products. Right. Interesting. Uh, shifting gears a little bit on the business impact of, you know, the, the major energy transition the sustainability, the kind of, you know, that the world is kind of going into. We've seen, you know, 2020, 2021, see some of the worst energy crisis globally mm -hmm. manifest. And I think as a, as a company, as a technologies and as, a, as an appliances company, you're really at the forefront of that. We're also kind of looking at a world where, you know, we are the world's very rapidly investing out of fossil fuels, but your alternatives are not at scale yet. So we'll go through periodic disruptions in energy supplies and shortages. Now that affects a company uh, like, like, like Electrolux with such a complex yeah. ex exposure to global supply chains quite severely. So is, how, how do you kind of so think about it at a strategy level? How do you mitigate that? Or how do you put plans in place to sort of, you know, uh, tied through those period of periods of disruption. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 exactly. I, I would, I wouldn't say that our operations are extremely energy consuming per se. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and by the way, we've um, already moved very, very heavily to to move our electricity supply to sustainable solutions around the world, and that's mm -hmm. part of that eighty percent uh, roadmap. So, so we're already, you know, much less exposed, I would say, to the ups and downs of directly mm -hmm. from from the energy cost now mm -hmm. what what makes a difference of course is for for consumers because they yeah um their purchasing power is impacted by higher yeah. uh, energy cost so so this that's of course a, a, a negative in many many different ways yeah uh, not not least in terms of of the, the the let's say wallet available for making other purchases than, than energy um but I think there's an opportunity hidden in that, and I think this is kind of part of the um, part of the reason why high energy prices aren't all bad, and that is that it makes sense to invest in energy efficiency and energy sustainability for mm -hmm. uh, a lot more uh, actors, including consumers. Buying more energy efficient appliances suddenly makes much more sense from a, a cost of living perspective, mm -hmm. right? So, so this is actually something that I view as um, yeah, painful, but but probably necessary um, mm -hmm. to accelerate the transition to uh, sustainable energy and, and, and energy efficiency. Right. I think I'll I'll kind of uh, close my question answer round with with some thoughts from you on where do you think um, you know which are the areas you think Asia can sort of lead this transition and sustainability stories. They're all already. I mean, we know where Asia lags behind, but 
where, where from your point of view, you think can, can sort of Asia lead that change in consumer um, you know, preferences and the general transition story that that's kind of unfolding globally? Yeah, I think that's a, an extremely, extremely important and, and relevant question, right? Because we, we, we know that a large majority of the world's population live in, in, in Asia Pacific. And as they uh, get to the level of affluence, when they start to consume more heavily uh, products yeah. that have a, 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 a significant climate footprint, then of course the need for that consumption increase to be sustainable is, is absolutely, uh, you know, it, it's going to determine the fate of the planet if I use some, some dramatic words, but, 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 but it's true, right? How, yeah. how Asian consumers consume in the coming 20, 30 years will determine how we are able as a planet to, to, to my, uh, manage through this, this climate crisis. So, so that, that is a huge responsibility for, for everybody acting uh, in the region yeah. um, to, to develop sustainable solutions and, um, and, and, and enabling consumers to live the life that they want. It's not about deprivation. It's about taking advantage of all the things that, that uh, many of us take for granted, but, but providing those solutions in, uh, in a sustainable way. So this is something we take incredibly seriously and, and see as a, as a fantastic uh, competitive opportunity as well, right? This is not a threat, this is a big opportunity for us. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rima. And uh, please uh, feel much. free to come back in here. We have quite a lot of questions. We will not have time for all of them, unfortunately, but I will start here um, on one on, uh, in terms of production and where, could, where to localize production, what is Electrolux strategy in the view of sensitive supply chains, but also in order to reach your sustainability targets? Yeah, yeah, I, I think we're, you know, the good news and the bad news is that we, we produce bulky products that are, are, are difficult and expensive to move around long distances. So we want to produce close to our end uh, users to the extent possible. And, and, and today, uh, approximately 80% a little bit more than 80% of all the products that we produce are sold in the region where they are produced, right? So Asia for Asia, North America for North America, and so on. Um, having, having said that, we still ship a lot of components around the world and, and, uh, and also products. So I, I think the direction that we're heading in is, is even more regionalization of our full supply chain, uh, cool. given the the climate and, 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 of course, transportation issues that we're facing, but also the, again, vulnerabilities to global supply chains that have been, uh, been exposed. Um, I think that the, 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 the topic more and more for us is not so much, um, um, let's say, it, it used to be that we, we had to, uh, for, for competitive reasons, move a lot of our uh, sourcing, uh, component sourcing and so on to low cost countries to be, be competitive. But as automation and, and modularization and autom uh, automation, you know, as, as, as equalized cost uh, around the world, it, it's more important to have scale locally and, and to pro uh, be able to have a, an integrated value chain in the region where we're operating. Um, so what, what do you see are the most important steps forward uh, that needs to be taken uh, over the coming one to two years you see in order to grow in Asia? Um, well, frankly, it's, for us, it's about investing. Um, investing more both in, in targeted um, product offerings that, that really target local consumer needs and um, market access, distribution and, and, and brand. It's, it's fairly... I would say fairly straightforward. There's no magic to it. We, we just, you know, we need, just need to make sure we commit the resources. And we've had a fantastic uh, uh, growth and profitable growth journey in APEC MIA in, 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 in last several years. So, so we're really creating the, the means to reinvest in, in the region mm. in a fantastic way. And, and, and we have, uh, yeah, very, very ambitious growth plans. Um, for, for um, APEC. You know, of course, because the, that's again, that's where the consumers are uh, today and also in the future. And uh, do, you, do you experience that Asian consumers are truly rewarding Electrolux as taking such a stance on sustainability? 
Yeah, uh, look, we're we're still a relatively small player, so we have to be uh, uh, humble on, on on that front. But I think to the extent that that consumers know us, um, you know, the the values that we represent resonate extremely well uh, with their needs. I, I think especially the let's say the urban uh, middle class that are are moving up uh, a little bit in life. The the type of innovation, the type of approach, and the t- and the and the, um, let's say, value base that we provide are resonating extremely well. So we're, yeah. uh, we're, we're really, really growing significantly in that target demographic. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I have a question here on uh, geopolitical uncertainty. Uh, how do you see that impacting the appliance industry? Um, not massively from a consumer demand perspective. It's more a question of, of the supply chains. So. So we, like many others, have been uh, very, very significantly exposed to the, the semiconductor uh, shortages that, that have, have uh, I, I guess it's probably a stretch to call that a geopolitical issue, but, but it's certainly a, an, an issue related to global supply chains that, that is uh, in, incredibly challenging for us, the, the cost of ocean transport, uh, the congestions and so on. So, so I think it's maybe less about geopolitics per se, and it's more about this sort of uneven exit from the COVID crisis yeah. that are providing a lot of strains on, on various parts of the supply chain, and, and, and that's causing a lot of, lot of challenges for us. Then, of course, if, 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 uh, if, if uh, God forbid, war breaks out in, in Ukraine or so on, that would have enormous consequences. But, um, but, but um, yeah, that's difficult to, to predict. Um, one question here regarding smart manufacturing. Are you investing heavily in that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, there's, there's two aspects to this, really. <clears throat> one is the, call it the shop floor uh, automation, um, responsiveness, and, 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 and problem solving, let's say, that's enabled by, uh, by digitalization and automation of our of our of our production and um, and and that in combination with um, what we talk a lot about is with this sort of end to end integrated digitally integrated supply chain of really knowing exactly where our components and our finished goods are in the value chain what the available capacity is of our critical suppliers at any given point in time uh, really provides us that that opportunity to be more resilient more efficient of course and that's always something that we, we spend a lot of time, efficiency and productivity, but, but very much resilience as well. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that has been less of a challenge historically, but now it's, it's a, probably our biggest challenge of really understanding what can we produce when, how, how do we meet consumer needs in a more flexible way? And that's all about digital and smart uh, uh, integration of our, of our value chain. Yeah. Yeah, um, you have already mentioned this a little bit, but I, I'll come back to, to the whole, um, you know, in terms of supporting and attracting, retaining talents and so, so on. You mentioned the For the Better framework. How do you see it supporting uh, with attracting, retaining talents, building brand desirability among consumers in order to justify mm-hmm. a premium price? Yeah, so, so we see, a, and this is something that also has been accelerated by, by the pandemic, that that people really want to associate themselves with, with companies, both from an employer perspective and from a, from a, a consumer perspective, with, with companies that have a, a purpose and, and a sense of, of responsibility um, that is, is greater than just about, you know, what the profit is next quarter. And, uh, and uh, we see that accelerating, especially of course among, among young people that they pick their employers uh, carefully and and they do research and we see that and and we see ourselves as uh, you know not just as electrics but as a swedish based company um having a, you know having a a good platform to um to talk about um, employer uh, values and, and talking about sustainability in a credible way so so this is really a strength in, in this environment i would say mm-hmm. Um, just one, I think we have time for maybe a couple of more questions. Um, there is one here on India. Mm-hmm. How are you looking at India in terms of investments? Yeah, India, of course, is, is uh, 
uh, one of the holy grails in, in many ways, in the sense that, that, that the, the number of consumers are, uh, is, 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 is enormous. But we've also historically had really, really significant challenges there. We were a, a fairly big player in, in India, um, but we were never profitable. Uh, and, and, and we were really facing a lot of operational challenges. So, so we um, actually um, uh, exited, exited manufacturing in India back in 2004 or five, something like that. And, and, but what's happened, of course, is as, as everybody knows, um, the ability to do business has massively improved in, in, in recent years. And, uh, and with a lot of economic growth. So now we're, we're getting back in uh, and we never left with the brand. We licensed the brand. We now have take, taken it back and, uh, and we see uh, opportunities to really grow in the premium end there, but we're taking it step by step uh, to not overextend ourselves. Okay, uh, I think I'll, I'll do two more questions. One biggie and one more personal. So uh, if you could just mention to sort of wrap up this discussion, uh, what you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities for the appliance industry in the next five to 10 years? Well, I, I hope that it is uh, how to get even closer to the, the consumer, right? We, we talked about smart appliances, smart home. You know, at, at the end of the day, people don't really, at the end of the day, care about smart they care about their needs being met in a in a personal and individualized and fast and responsive way so that's really our task we need to get closer and closer and closer to the individual consumer making sure that that again uh, using a lot of digital technology ai smartness all of those things in a seamless way to make sure that they then um, can go about their daily ways, daily, daily lives in, in, a, in a sustainable way and in, in an in enjoyable way. I mean, that's really our purpose. Shape living for the better is, is, is our mantra. And that's what I hope is going to be the biggest challenge. On the other hand, of course, we, we've seen uh, in, in recent years and over the years that, you know, history has a way of throwing new, new challenges in, in our paths. And, and I'm sure that's going to continue. And that's why it's so important to have a, a strong core strong core uh, of, of beliefs and, and, a, and a core strategy uh, that's resilient over time. You're on mute, I think. You're on mute, sorry. Sorry, uh, last yeah. uh, audience question here. Uh, how has your leadership style evolved uh, during the past two years during the pandemic? Well, it's it's an interesting question because, of course, it's changed. It's had to change in, in many different ways, and and you know, in a way, of course, you're 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 working more remote. Um, but I would say, and I, I assume that a lot of people feel the same way. I've actually been able to get closer to a lot more people uh, through this type of, of medium, right, through video. And as you get more and more comfortable with that, you can actually interact with so many more people digitally than you can physically and and um, to me that's been a, a you know a, a, actually a very positive part of, of this very negative period that yeah. I've been able to interact with in, in you know personally individually and, and in, 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 in in many different ways with so many more people and and what I've found is that what people really care about is again we talked about it here is, is the is the, the why right the the what you know, is is quick. You can you can talk about the what really, uh, really, really quickly, and and that's important. Mm. But the why is getting even more important, and especially in in these times that are challenging for all of us on a personal level and a society level. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? And if you can provide the you know relevant answers and the, and the right roadmap for that, that becomes a, a much more interesting way to spend your your day right both both for me as as a, as a leader and for for everybody in the organization definitely i can definitely sign up for that well our time is almost up uh, a big huge thank you first of all to you Nas samson for taking time to be with us today uh, we okay. have really appreciated both your openness candidness and to, uh, to hear your take on the past few years of what's coming. That has been super interesting, really. And Rima Bhattacharya, thank you for leading this discussion. Sure, Having your pleasure. expertise uh, on both a APAC and the sustainability issues has really brought this discussion to another level as well. So thank you so much.
I would also like to th send a big thank you to uh, the Electrolux uh, team here in APAC, Enrique Patrickson, Samara Fai, and to Martin von Aronet in Stockholm uh, for helping setting uh, up this session with Jonas. Uh, Anna has now sent out a quick survey, one minute survey in the chat room. Uh, we would be super grateful if you could fill that out um, so that we can also see how we can make the CEO series even better next time. But personally, I think it's been fantastic today. So thank you for everybody involved. So Swedcham APAC will be back soon uh, with new digital events. And although we are getting back face-to-face uh, -face locally, we will keep this platform for prominent guests from our worldwide Swedish business community. And if you're in the audience today thinking that your CEO should be on this stage, tell your local Swedcham team and we will work with you to make it happen. So all the best to all of you and see you soon at Swedcham.